It's found in Acts 15 and verse 18. Known to God from eternity are all his works. Known to God from eternity are all his works. This too, we might say, has three parts to it. Known to God, one, from eternity, two, are all his works. God is the protagonist or the personage who, on whom the focus is placed. God, from eternity, might, reminds us of duration, and all his works represents the subject. Known to God from eternity are all his works. Do you know that there are some people who do not believe in God? We call them atheists. They tell me that 13% of the world population consider themselves atheists. The three leading nations, China, North Korea, and the Czech Republic. But even here in the Western world, we have atheists. They now call the new atheists. Among them, we have Dawkins, Dennett, Hitchens, and Harris. Now, the Bible says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Notice that the Bible didn't say, the stupid ones have said. These men are brilliant. They're not stupid. What it means when it says, the fool has said in his heart is, the evidence is there presented, but they ignore it. They reject it. So they're not stupid, but they're fools, because in spite of the evidence, they think otherwise. Their books, Making the Circuit, The God Delusion, and The End of Faith. These were written by atheists. But there's a website that says, God loves atheists too. Amen! <laughs> you know that there are some atheists, avowed atheists, former avowed atheists, who came to faith. I have a list here. It's not exhaustive, but I'll mention these. Sai Chung, a Chinese. Walter Veit, a South African. Guillaume Bignon, a Frenchman. <laughs> Dr. Holly Ordway, and you have also heard of Lee Strobel. So God loves them. So we should not cast them out. God loves them. Known to God from eternity are all his works. There's a website. It's called apologeticspress.org. It's a very good site, so maybe you can check it out. Apologeticspress.org. Now, there's a gentleman by the name of Neil Shenvey who responded in an article to the book The End of Faith written by Harris. And I like what he says here. There it is. Can you see that? It's very faint. Anyway, let me read what it says here. He says, it is not enough to believe that God exists. All of Jesus' teaching assumes God's existence as the most basic of premises. The real question addressed by the Bible is not the question of God's existence, but the question of God's glory. How can God's goodness coexist with human beings who are so bent to evil? I want to thank the young people for that special music. Amazing grace. You did well. And the wonderful thing is that this is a new uh, computer that I just got, and I named it Grace 
alone. <laughs> so thank you for amazing grace. So how can God's goodness coexist with human beings who are so bent on evil? The question of God's existence cannot and should not be addressed as a purely intellectual exercise any more than a man dying of thirst can approach the question of the existence of water with bland intellectual curiosity. And here's the clincher. Either God exists and his glory is my very reason to live or his existence is a lie that ought to be subjected to ridicule wherever it is encountered. What he's saying is, it is not just enough to say that God exists, but how am I living in relation to that fact? Am I living for God's glory? That is the question. Now what does God know? Keeps flipping. Maybe I'm one step ahead on this. Ah, I know what the problem is. Thank you. <laughs> I didn't connect. You see how important it is to connect? If we're not connected, we're going nowhere. <laughs> I didn't connect. <laughs> Thank you for coming to my aid. Hallelujah. It's good to have help. <laughs> God is good, God is great. So now there I am. What God knows about hair. Matthew 10, 30. Even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Did you hear that? Even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. That is to say, God knows everything about you. Notice the word, even the very his. So God is concerned about the individual, declaring to each individual his eternal value in Jesus and preparing them for his soon return. The individual is important. And here's what Jesus knows, what the Son knows about the Father and works. John 5, 17. My father has been working until now, and I have been working. This is what Jesus said. My father has been working until now, and I have been working. James MacDonald of Walk in the Word Ministry says, God is at work in every circumstance to grow our faith. So Jesus says, my father has been working until now. So that means God is still working. God is actively involved in the affairs of humankind today. His watchful eye sees every facet of society and the going, goings on therein. God is concerned. Nothing takes him by surprise. He's not stumped by anything. My father has been working until now, and I have been working. What is he working towards? He's working toward our redemption, our eternal salvation. What is his desire? God is looking for people who will make a covenant with him by sacrifice, who will live righteously, godly in this present evil age. So back to the three aspects, all about God. Three things. What did God do? What is God doing? What will God do? What did God do? Let's go to Genesis chapter 1. 26 and 27. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, 
according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Notice here that there are three things. There's vision or there's thought. Let us make man. Procedure. In our own image after our likeness. Purpose. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, etc. So, God created man in his own image after his likeness. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Male in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now this, I, I look at this as a looped concept. The concept here is looped. Let us make man in our own image. Verse 27, so God created man in his own image. That's one part of the loop. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. With this in mind, we see that even though the concept is looped, it is so tightly looped that there is no space or no loophole. Do you get it? So tight. What excludes, what is excluded? Here's what he says. Male and female, he created them. So gender neutrality, gender confusion, according to creation order, should not exist. Creation order, creation order. Then God blessed them and God said, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion, etc. So my father has been working until now and I have been working. God has established the parameters of behavior. What God knows about his thoughts. Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. To give you a future and a hope. There we have coupling also, but I won't go into that. Thoughts of peace, not of evil. Future and a hope. And why is he thinking these thoughts? Because whatever God does, he does it so that it can last. He makes things to last. And Ecclesiastes 3.11 says, He has put eternity in our hearts. When God created man, his intention was for man to live on and on and on and never, never die. He has put eternity in our hearts. So are we living in the light of eternity? Are we living with eternity in view? That is the question. Not only that God exists, but how am I living in relation to that fact? Am I living for his glory is the question. Is my life all about God? Am I absorbed with him? Is he the love of my life? What God knows about himself. Isaiah 46, 9, 10. I am God, there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Does God have a desire? He says, I will do all my pleasure. So he must have desire. What is his burning passion? Human beings. We are the object of God's passion. I have loved thee with an everlasting love. 
Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. Moving on. Our next text is Exodus 19 and verse 5. The last part says, All the earth is mine. All the earth is mine. But we need to look at the first verse in this chapter, chapter 19, because there's something for us to understand clearly. Exodus 19, verse 5. The last part says, All the earth is mine. Let me read the whole verse. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. But let's go to verse 1. In the third month after the children of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on the same day they came to the wilderness of Sinai. For they had departed from Rephidim and had come to the wilderness of Sinai and camped in the wilderness. So Israel camped there before the mountain. And Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, Tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. The question is, is God being exclusive here? Is he casting out everybody else and just focusing on the children of Israel? According to verse 1, God had just delivered them from Egypt. So he wanted to establish a new thing for his glory. Because he is God and sovereign, he determines what method he's going to use to accomplish his purposes. I will do all my pleasure. He is God, he determines the methodology. So, in his sovereign wisdom, he said, I'm going to choose Israel to show the world something. Israel was not to, lay or to live apart from the world, apart in the sense that they're special. The whole thing here is not their superiority. The thing is, God's plan is superior, superlative, and sublime. It's his purpose that the focus should be placed on. So he said, all the earth is mine. They were to show to the nations about what God is like. Let me stop here a little. Can I stop here for a little? We are going to do a little exercise. Put your hands up like that. Okay, thank you. Take them down. Do you know that hands are practically indispensable? We need our hands. We do a lot with our hands. One hand. Do you know how many bones are in the hand? How many? Okay. There are 27, not including the sesamoid bone. They say that the ses not everybody has the sesamoid bone. bone. 27 bones. Okay, how many digits on each hand? Five. So if we put the two hands up, we have five, five digits here, five digits here, ten. Now, how many bones do we have in the ten digits? What's the number? Two, how many? Okay, let's do it. Three, six, nine, twelve, and two, fourteen. Fourteen, fourteen make what? Twenty-eight. Do you know that something is going on right now in San Antonio? The GC. Seventh-day Adventists have 28 fundamental beliefs. God has chosen the Seventh-day Adventist church to proclaim his message. 
Are we more special than other people? No. no. Not in the sense that God sees it. We are special in the sense if we follow and do what God says so that we are His representatives. That is the focus. Not that we are superior better than other people, but God's plan or purpose is superior, sublime, superlative. So we pray for that session that's going on. We ask for God's guidance so that he can use the Seventh-day Adventist church to tell the truth for today. Ravi Zacharias says, the Bible is the truth about God's revelation, self-revelation. We cannot find out God. The scientists are trying to find out God. Job said, can't thou by searching find out God? can thou find out the Almighty unto perfection? God cannot be placed in a test tube. He cannot be the subject of scientific investigation. God has to reveal himself, self-revelation. And he wants to reveal who he is through a people who are living close to him. Can we and will we be that people? All the earth is mine, but I must move on quickly. God knows all his works. All the earth is his. And now he says, Ezekiel 18, 4, Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. The soul who sins shall die. What is the emphasis here? There might be several emphases. All souls are mine. That's basic, that's foundational. God is the creator. Whether we believe he exists or not, it is still fact. He is the one who made us. Luke, one, Psalm 100, verse 3. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. In him we live, move, and have our being. Whether you are atheist or believer, God made you. So he says, Behold, all souls are mine, foundational. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. The soul who sins shall die. What is God saying here in that last part? The soul who sins shall die. You see, God established creation order. Creation order. Focus on that, creation order. When he set up the plan. He did not intend for man to die. He wanted a perfect relationship, but that relationship got severed because sin came in. And so, whatever checks in contrary to creation order is utterly flawed and ultimately counterproductive. And based on the law of cause and effect, it will reap its own consequences. That's why he says here, the soul who sins shall die. God doesn't kill people. The choices we make determine our destiny. I like that all souls are mine. When God created man, he gave him freedom of choice. God doesn't force. He wants a relationship based on love. And so we have freedom. But there's a subtle difference between freedom and liberty. Yes, we have freedom. But we cannot abolish the consequences of our choices and actions. The soul who sins shall die. Now, does God want any of us to die and be lost forever? No. Based on creation order, 
He created the world in six days. On the third day, he caused the trees to come forth. Jesus, the God-man, came into his creation. The creator became a creature. And he died on Calvary's cross for our redemption. So the question is, plausibility, anyone? The plan of creation took the salvation route. The plan of salvation took the creation route. Are you deciding which is which? Let's look quickly at Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Let, verse 5, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, a creature, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. So the creator became a creature, taking the likeness of men, so that he can die on a cross, a tree that was created according to creation order on the third day. And on that hill, there were three crosses. And in the middle was the Son of God, dying for my redemption. And thank God, on the third day, he arose. And he came up from the dead, conqueror. And now he lives forever. What is he doing? He's at the right hand of the Father. So what did God do? He created. What is God doing? Jesus is now interceding on our behalf. And right now the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the entire world to show himself strong in the behalf of those whose hearts are perfect toward him. What is he doing? He's looking for a people who would rightly represent him in this present evil age. There's much going on. Our focus ought not be the evil that is taking place about us. It's all about God. He exists. Am I living for his glory? That's the focus. God is concerned. What God did, what God is doing. So all souls are mine. This day with God, Ellen White says, the cost of the blood of Christ shows the value of the soul. This day with God, page 171. He came from the royal courts of heaven to this world to show how great an interest he had in man. And the infinite price paid for the redemption of man shows that man is of so great value that Christ could sacrifice his riches and honor in the royal courts to lift him from the degradation of sin. Oh, thank God for Jesus. Where would we be without Jesus? We'd be forever lost but we have a choice. Are we going to accept him as Lord and Savior? Are we going to open up? He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Yes, he is creator. He stands outside the door as creator. But if we open up the door, he comes in as redeemer. God wants to save us. What is our response? He says, Jeremiah 32, 27. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Can God give us the victory over our evil traits? Can he deliver us from corruption? Can he restore his image in us? 
It is his desire so to do. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? I listen to Ravi Zacharias a lot. He's a Christian apologist. And he says that there are basically four questions, four issues. Origin, meaning, morality, and destiny. If we go back to what I said earlier about all, all has four functions. Adjective, adverb, noun, pronoun. Well, there might be a link here. Origin, meaning, morality, destiny. Origin, where did I come from? Meaning, why am I here? Morality, how do I live since I'm here, now that I'm here? And destiny, where would I end up when it's all said and done? Four questions, four issues. We each, have, each one of us has to decide. What God did, he created us. What is he doing? He's trying to bring us back into the fold. What will he do? Let's go to Revelation. Revelation 21. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Verse 2. Revelation 21. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. The emphasis, behold, I make all things new. So my question is, the plan of creation took the salvation route or the plan of salvation took the creation route? I opt for this one. The plan of salvation took the creation route. Creation order is important. If we go contrary to creation order, we reap the consequences of our choices. God has given us freedom of choice. He wants us to choose wisely. So that when he comes, he can say, gather unto me, my saints from the four corners of the earth, those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. And then we will say, lo, this is our God. We have waited for him and he will save us. Amen. Four hundred fifty three in the old hymnal. They come from the east and west. Let us stand. They come from the east and west. They come from the north and south. Invited to join with Jesus as guests and dwell in our Father's house to gaze at his lovely face and clothe with his purity. Join with him in 
song and joy throughout eternity. They come from the thorny path, they come from the stormy sea, they come from the hills, they come from the days, they come now, O Lord, to Thee. Arrayed in his marriage robes, the bridegroom so soon to see. He who hung upon the cross to win their victory. He gathers a countless host, redeemed, redeemed by his grace from wrong. No more any sin. No more any sin, no more any tears, no more any night so long. All things are now passed away, all things are become as new. Joy shall reign eternally, for death is ended too. They come from the thorny path, they come from the stormy sea, they come from the hills, they come from the dales, they come now, O Lord, to thee, arrayed in his marriage robes, arrayed in his marriage robes, their bridegroom so soon to see. He who hung upon the cross to win the victory. Remember the pearly gate stands open for you and me. Our Savior has gone a place to prepare for those he from sin set free. Loved ones who have passed away are resting within the grave, are waiting God's last trumpet call for those He came to save. They come from the thorny path, they come from the stormy sea, they come from the hills, they come from the days, they come now, O Lord, to Thee, arrayed in His marriage robe, their bridegroom so soon to see. He who hung upon the cross to win their victory. Let us pray. Eternal God, you have put create eternity in our hearts. Your desire in the beginning was for us to live and never die. You said you'll accomplish your purposes, your counsel will stand, and it is your plan to have a people that will not die. Help us to choose you, because by choosing you, we choose life. Amen.